Lord Rana, thank you so much for that. Um, I have to tell you all that I have been introduced in the past as Helena Kennedy, the lawyer who represents women and other criminals. <laughs> Quite a lot of you here today. <laughs> um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here in Northern Ireland, land of my forebears. Um, I received the invitation through my dear and close friend John Miskelly, who's a great friend of Tony Kennedy, and uh, he, John is one of uh, life's great forces for good. He was involved in Cooperation Ireland, he was one of the instigators of that, and, uh, and uh, the creator of many different uh, cultural um, uh, organisations to create stronger community ties, north and south, and, uh, and he has been really inspirational. Um, but he's also a force that cannot be refused when he asks you anything. So, of course, I'm, I was thrilled to be invited. But then the more I knew about the organisation and the more I knew about John Hewitt, the more I felt that this was something very close um, to me. Um, it, it was easy to be persuaded because John Hewitt, um, uh, obviously, is uh, someone who whose poetry is exquisite. Uh, I spent uh, um, some time reading his work, and it really was was wonderful. Um, a man of the arts, a, a curator of, of, of galleries, somebody who has, has, his name has great cultural significance. And he was also a progressive, a man who wanted uh, a better society. So um, he spoke very strongly to me when I read of, of him. I had five grandparents, um, strange you may say, um, but my grandfather Kennedy um, was from the south, um, and uh, just outside of Dublin, south of Dublin, um, and in Wicklow. And he was a regular soldier in the Dublin Fusiliers um, and was killed in the first week of the First World War. Um, and my grandmother was, was pregnant, expecting my father, and my father was born on the 1st of September, so just, just a, a week or so after his own father was killed. And, um, and my grandmother wasn't told that uh, the telegram had come um, because she was just going into labour. And so my father was born posthumously, and uh, he always claimed, um, we always claimed, that we were related to the Kennedys, uh, those Kennedys. Now that I'm a baroness, they claim that they're related to me. <laughs> anyway, my grandmother, um, my grandma Kennedy, my grandma was, became Grandma Duffy because she was from Fermanagh, and she then married um, a man from her hometown in Eskillen. And... Uh, and that man, uh, in fact, became my father's father, and a wonderful father he was too, and my father loved him dearly. So that was on my grandfather's um, side, my father's side. On my mother's side, both her parents were from, Ma from, from Anna too. So as you see, I was, I'm grown from these parts. It's in my blood. In fact, um, one of John Hewitt's uh, poems said it clearly, Above my door, the rushy cross, and turf upon my hearth for I am of the Irishy, by nurture and by birth. So I do feel very Irish. I was once given an honorary degree by the University of Ireland, and at the end of the, the citation they said, Chancellor, we ask you um, to confer a degree on uh, Helena Kennedy, an Irish woman from Scotland. <laughs> um, in fact, one of my uncles, Jack Maguire, who was a teacher in Glasgow, was dying, and he asked that the soil of Fermanagh, the sod of Fermanagh, it's there, just, just as, uh, as John Hewitt describes it, he wanted the sod of Fermanagh to be placed in his dying hand. The Irish are great ones for gestures like that, as you know. Um, but it explains, I think, my pleasure in being with you and the honour it is for me to be addressing you on this occasion. And I love the title, the title of this gathering, um, in dreams begin responsibilities. It's a, provo a provocation, really, for us to think deeper thoughts. The word dream is ethereal, intangible, in signifying that which is not yet real, whereas the word responsibilities is weighted with the very reality of everyday life. The words seem unmatched, sitting in close proximity in one sentence, yet they carry a truth that, that cannot be denied, which is that every great project starts with a dream. Every success story started with uh, some seed of hope, every ambitious ambition with a secret wish, imagining what the impossible might actually look like. And as the dream takes form and shape, as it becomes a reality, it moves to a different stage of being. 
It inevitably involves the harder business of making something work, securing a permanence, sustaining it. It asks of us a commitment and it asks of us that we make allowances for the other. It means duties, obligations and responsibilities. Now, there isn't one of us in this room who cannot conjure the dreams which have made up our lives. Our dreams of success when we were children, of being famous, of having a recognition of our talents, our dreams of falling in love with somebody who would be gorgeous and wonderful, but who would also recognise how gorgeous and wonderful we were. Um, what we didn't know then, which is one of the things that we learn as we grow older, is that success in every chosen field, in our career, in our relationships, in any enterprise, in peace process making, in union making, the fulfillment of any dream means accepting and working at the responsibilities that go with that endeavour. Making dreams work requires work. My husband and I got married, in fact, in Rome. My mother loved that. If she felt that, you know, it gave the impression to everybody in Glasgow that the Pope had uh, uh, con conferred, uh, especially since I was her wayward daughter. Um, but um, uh, there were many reasons for us going off um, in our 30s and getting married in Rome, and part of it was I had hundreds of relatives and my husband had <laughs> nearly one. And so it was, it was going to be difficult to do it uh, in a different way, and we came back and had a huge informal party. But my husband now describes all of this as if it just somehow happened miraculously, um, totally oblivious of the careful planning that went into that casual event. Making dreams work requires work. So dreams are often utopian, and none the worse for that, and some of the best things in civilization have only come about through aspirations of a grand kind. And I thought about it as I looked at your wonderful Armagh Cathedral, and I think about it whenever I'm in you know, bits of Europe or wherever, and I see great cathedrals, some of them dating back to the 12th century, or any other monolithic structure, and you know that at that time the people who built those things, for them it was a, somehow it was, it was an, a, an, an act of faith. I mean, they, they worked on the stone carving, those stone masons, on those vaulting arches and creating all those sort of amazing... Um, carvings, um, it was really, in creating those, those buildings, they often didn't live to see the end of their endeavour. Um, they built them to the glory of God. It was their faith that sustained them. But every one of them knew that they were moving towards something that was going to be great. And that's what we do, even when we're doing it in the world of politics. When you have grand ambitions to create peace, to create a better world, to actually work together in collaboration to great, create good things. Sometimes there'll be disappointments on the way. You know, I would be the first person to say that there are aspects of the European Union that I, I feel disappointed about. It hasn't got there. But it has only been 40 years. And I do think that perhaps it takes longer to make things that are truly lasting and of wonder. And the march of civilization has been all about dreams and then the hard work and sacrifice of making them a reality. Nothing great comes easily. All gains come out of struggle, and we know that. History is so often told from the perspective of the powerful, the great man theory of history, and we're presented with a narrative that often forgets the roles of our poets, our visionaries, our dreamers, who had to resist the powerful forces of the time. In reality, the real gains of freedom and liber liberty and equality came from the challenges to vested power, from those who demanded their fair share, who demanded justice. And only a year or two ago, we celebrated Magna Carta, when the king's authority was challenged and the rule of law was established, saying that nobody was above the law. And of course, it's gone on around the world to mean that governments too have to keep to the law, that government ministers, people who are servants of the crown, police officers, army, army people, anybody, immigration officers, that they too have to be observant of law and the standards of law. And so while Magna Carta didn't do very much for women or for serfs, it started a process in which we recognise that struggle is the only way, in fact, that you seize some power away from those who are powerful. When Martin Luther King declared, I have a dream, he knew that he was posing a really profound challenge to the status quo. That famous speech at the Washington demonstration paved the way for the Civil Rights Act, which took place the following year in 1964. 
Hame's dream, as we know, was that former slaves, Negro slaves, who'd been seared in the flames of withering injustice, and slave owners would sometimes sit down together on the red hills of Georgia. He asked how it could be possible that black people should experience so much poverty in the midst of an ocean of material prosperity. He said that the great gathering of black people in Washington had come to cash a check. The founding fathers had promised all men life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Not just some men, not just white men. And he argued, and as we as lawyers would say, that there was a promissory note in that great declaration that created the United States of America. He pointed out that America had defaulted on that promissory note, and he wanted justice for all God's children. But he also warned, he also warned his own people. He warned the black people on the march of their responsibilities, and it goes back to the title of these events. He advised the campaigners not to become guilty of wrongful deeds and to conduct their struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline, not to let their creative protest degenerate into violence. He was very clear that distrust of white people should not be fostered, pointing out that there were white people in the demonstration too who joined in their cause, pointing out that their destiny was tied with the destiny of black people. Their freedom is inextricably bound with our freedom. We cannot walk alone. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Our children should not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. And of course, we here in Ireland have undoubtedly been involved in similar challenges of turning dreams of peace into something lasting. You have had to recognise that the destiny of your communities, which were once divided, are inextricably linked. Your destinies are tied. You've had to absorb in the very deep way the true meaning of the concept that all men are created and women are created equal and that no one should be judged by the colour of their skin or of their religion or their gender or their sexuality or their ability, physical or not, or by the anything other than the content of character. But none of it's easy, and we know that. Most people are never tested with the reality of having to confront things as hard as divided societies have to, particularly after periods of conflict. Lip service is paid to it by many in their lives, but where there has been long historic differences, it is undoubtedly hard. And we see that in the United States, for example, today, still, where black people feel still um, that they have not had their fair share. Transferring dreams into reality involves mutuality and respect and responsibilities. Now, the dream that has suffused my life was about trying to create a just world and doing it through law. I love the law, and I've spent my professional life in the courts, and as Lord Rana said, largely um, you know, doing the kinds of cases he mentioned, um, representing women and children, um, seeking a better order for them within law. Um, I'm a jury trial lawyer, and so I've done criminal cases of a high order, terrorism, national security, espionage, homicide. Um, and it may seem strange to choose that as an area of law. Not everyone um, uh, would find it attractive, but I have actually found it you know, the most fulfilling of lives um, because you learn in a visceral way why fairness and justice matters in people's lives, why having a fair trial is a fundamental human right, because you see the consequences for real human beings when our obligations are forgotten as they sometimes are, when there are miscarriages of justice. Um, and I've acted in cases um, where there have been miscarriages of justice, some of them arising out of these troubles, but others involving, for example, the mothers of babies who died from sudden infant death and from that terrible syndrome, um, but who were wrongly convicted of murder. Or when people who have been persecuted face a wall of disbelief when they come here seeking asylum. It's our clients who actually teach us about human rights. And it's from my clients that I've most certainly learned how painful the abuse of human rights is and what it does to those who abuse as well as to those who are abused. The law has to keep writing itself. We have to keep on it. We have to be vigilant and improving standards and learning how to do it better.
And the big challenges for lawmakers today involve globalisation. Most law is deeply embedded, of course, as we know, in our national structures, in the idea of the nation state. It's the national courts, by and large, that deal with um, things that go wrong. It's the state which has obligations and responsibilities to provide legal avenues for their citizens to seek redress when things have gone wrong or where they have been wronged, or to protect citizens from crimes and other abuses. But a nation's law comes out of you know, deep wellsprings of national experience and often out of struggle against tyranny or against vest vested interests. And so law is the bedrock inside nations. Um, and it's when law seems to have its source outside that we run into particular trouble. There is an instinctive suspicion and resistance by many citizens to the idea of international courts. And it's why currently we have the political Brexit red line around the European Court of Justice and a lot of manoeuvring around the European Convention of Human Rights and a call for disconnection from both those courts. And there are two separate courts, as you know. The spectre of foreign courts and foreign justice is so easy to, to, to stir up prejudice against. And yet many of the big threats to our world span borders, grappling with their complexity, and it's beyond the capacity of one nation. The problems are easy to identify, and I deal with them in the courts, international terrorism. Um, not enough in the courts, the financial chicanery by multinational corporations, um, avoiding their tax responsibilities, and the rich doing that too, avoiding tax on a vast scale. And it makes uh, national governments um, uh, have difficulties about governing in the interests of everybody if, uh, if they don't have a resource with which to do it. And so we see so many feeling left behind. Um, environmental damage, climate change, the trafficking of people, the trafficking of arms and drugs and fissile material, human organs. And then there's the problem of mass migration and, and what we de do in facing that and the role of law in it. And so the only way to deal with cross-border crime or misconduct or problems is through cross-border law and regulation. You can't trade across borders without having cross-border law. And so the very advances which make global markets work across borders um, also lead to dysfunction and to international crime, because that's the underbelly of the market. And all the things that make all of that possible, electronic transfers of money and so on, and ease of travel and so forth, all of that can be used by criminal enterprises too. And so we have to recognise that there is, unfortunately, like it or not, and I keep having to say it to those in government, law has its role and we have to recognise that important reality. At the end of the war, people, the Second World War, people dreamt on a grand scale. They dreamt of creating a world order that would deliver peace and security and justice. And they created things towards that end, the United Nations. They created conventions to protect the rights of people so that they couldn't be stateless, to protect refugees, because we'd seen what the war did in dislocating people and how people fleeing war and conflict, we see it now in Syria, um, uh, need protections. The creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the creation in turn of the Council of Europe and then of the European Union and of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, of course, the challenge to, to us today is to reform and develop some of those institutions which were developed way back then because institutions do need to evolve and need to be shifted and changed, but that is where our duties and responsibilities lie. Um, they shouldn't be weakened, those institutions, um, but we should be streaking, seeking to strengthen them um, and the ties that are necessary, um, and we need to deal with the strengthening of international law, not the diminishment of it. I love the dream of Eleanor Roosevelt. It was she who said after the Second World War, never again, when the disclosures of the Holocaust suddenly were, those photographs were appearing in newspapers around the world and in picture posts, horrible pictures of people in Belson, those living skeletons, um, the piles of body, <coughs> bodies. The full egregious inhumanity of what took place became clear when those camps were opened up. And she recognised that this was a highly 
sophisticated nation, Germany, um, which had put its cleverest people to the task of exterminating. It's not that, you know, civilised nations don't do these kinds of things, that we've somehow got to a place where it can't happen. The veneer of civilization can be stripped away all too quickly. And, uh, and it was clever people, lawyers and judges, who lent themselves to the corruption of law and used their powers in the courts to send people off to concentration camps, Jews, gays, people who were disabled, people who were dissidents of one form or another, and doctors who experimented and selected for those terrible treatments, engineers who created gas chambers with the help of scientists who developed the drugs to be used in the gassing of people. And politicians and army personnel designed the plan and executed it. So we're not talking here about gross violence with machetes. We're talking about sophisticated people capable of terrible inhumanity. So she wanted to create global law which would outlaw such conduct and cruelty. She wanted to create a, 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 a system of law somehow that would hold that in check. And she drew to her apartment in Washington Square on, uh, in February 1947 a gathering of lawyers and jurists from around the world. She asked that question, how can we create global law, law to make people behave ethically? That There has to be some sort of set of morality that informs the way that they operate as lawyers. How can we do that to underpin all societies? And she asked the question, are there universal values? And together those people around her dining table, people from Africa, people from India, people from Canada and Latin America, from the Soviet Union, from America, from here, from um, um, Lebanon, from, some, from Muslim countries too, ask those questions. And the answer, of course, is that, that people do share values. Nobody went to that table with clean hands. You know, there were Jim Crow laws in America where there was still terrible racism. There, was, there were the gulags in the Soviet Union that were only just be coming out and being revealed. We had the history of colonialism. Um, in, for us in Africa and in other parts of the world. So we, there was nobody with clean hands. Um, but people sat around and talked about what it was that people shared. And of course people share the same yearnings and the same fears. People want to love and be loved. They want family life. And they want protections for those things. They want protections for their beliefs because people everywhere want to know why are we here, what are we here for, what is our purpose. They want to understand the meaning of life. And so spirituality, too, and the right to have your religious beliefs have to be protected. The right to liberty, to freedom from torture, because everybody knows the meaning of pain. But what we also know is what inflicting pain and, and degradation on others does to the humanity of the person who's doing it. The right to life the desire to live in community, to organize with others, the desire to know and learn, all those things seeking protection, the desire and the right to have a home and a roof over your head. And so those questions were the ones that were really struggled with in those gatherings and came to be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, recognizing that you can't create global law, but you can create a template of, of values against which every legal system can be tested. Are we living up to these standards? And that's its purpose. And that became translated in turn into the European Convention of Human Rights and in turn then into law in our respective countries. And so we struggle with it. It's not a thing to be resolved in one act of legislation, but a permanent struggle, civilizing us, making us better, trying to do the thing that we all want, which is to be good to be good in our lives and to give meaning to what that is all about. I'll not pretend to you that the referendum result did anything but cause me deep sadness. And I know that many of you in this audience may feel differently. And it's not that I don't have my criticisms of the European U Union, but I do still believe in the dream. For me, it was about not just trading together, trading with our closest neighbours, and doing so in ways that were ethical and where standards were right, where you didn't sell inferior goods, where people did have protections in the ways that they bought and sold, and that there could be implementation and enforcement through law across our boundaries. But it was also about peace and solidarity across borders, and mutuality, 
and a coalition of values in the larger goal of creating a world of peace and justice, to be an entity within that bigger whole. By being part of a trading bloc, we do commerce together, one to the other, but then as a community, we, and with strength in our numbers, we trade with the world. But in doing that, we set standards. We say, in all of that, and we've been struggling with it and developing it over the years, what are your supply chains? Are you employing children in your sources? Is there lead in your paint? Are your pharmaceuticals contaminated so that they're likely to lead to thalidomide? It's about setting standards in the way that we do business and we do projects together. The ways in which we have complied and we have and cooperated and created great research projects improving our world and our lives. And I think we're making a grave mistake and it flies in the face of what uh, is needed in a world which is in fact in many respects in crisis. Going like it alone seems like a retreat to me. Some have wanted this for a very long time and I think that some of those harbour nostalgic ideas of a Britain of old, of a United Kingdom as it once was, unaware that the world has changed. Others are ideologues who believe absolutely in untrammeled free markets and resile from any significant regulation of trading. And the fact that collaboration has given us, as I've said, contaminant-free food and tested drugs and pharmaceuticals and pesticides which we have to reach certain standards and all manner of protections that we hardly know about and that people hardly knew about when they came to vote in the referendum. Um, and yet, for many reasons, some people don't want them because they see them as limitations on the profit-making abilities of, and ambitions of companies. The global economic crisis of 2008 is still having huge reverberations on the lives of people. The crisis affecting our economy is, in fact, the crisis of our civilization. The values that we hold dear are the very same values that got us to this point. The meltdown in our economy is a harsh symbol, to me, of the meltdown in some of our values. It's as if our house is on fire and the flames are coming through the second floor windows and we think that that's where the fire is raging, but in fact the fire is raging somewhere else. The economic crisis is a symptom of things that have gone wrong in our culture, our cultures which are um, increasingly about individualism, which uh, has been raised now almost to a religion. Uh, and the idea that somehow appearance matters more than substance. Success seems to justify greed, and greed justifies indifference to our fellow human beings. We thought that our actions only affected our own sphere, but with globalism, the consequences are felt much further afield. We saw appalling financial decisions made in the United States, but also made here, and they've had a domino effect down through our communities. And that's why it's necessary to have a fundamental rethink about the prevailing neoliberal economic model. The most important thing to know is that we are more connected than we ever suspected before. A visible and invisible mesh links economies and cultures around the world. And we took the success of our economy as proof of the rightness of its underlying philosophy. And that underlying philosophy was that, um, of course, uh, that the state should be smaller, that the state shouldn't be looking after those who might need help at times of joblessness, at times of, of agedness, at times of sickness, at times when things are not going well. And I'm afraid the philosophy of neoliberalism has been arid and cruel. The idea that the, a small state is going to be a happy state, I think we're seeing, might not be true. The idea that taxes have to be ever and ever and ever reduced um, for the wealthiest and for corporations, imagining somehow that wealth trickled down without, without the need for support and assistance from a state, an enabling state. And we've seen welfare being cut to the bone. We've seen parts of our societies abandoned, um, places uh, that once were pit towns um, having no pit and therefore no work, places that were steel towns having no steelworks and therefore no work. Um, places that were factory, based on the, you know, the, the notion of factories manufacturing things, and the factories being closed, and uh, people having no work. And somehow little being done to help replace that. And so it's led to 
um, a de great deal of indebtedness for people and immiseration because indebtedness was encouraged. Um, and we've also seen the hoarding of wealth. And so for the many, the quality of life has been deteriorating and there is anger. Um, the only hope is a fundamental re-examination, I think, of the values that we've been living with for the past 30 years, and we are at a crossroads. And I think people are right to feel angry and to ask questions about what brought them to this, uh, this state, what meant that there had to be austerity pol uh, policies which, may, which they shouldered, they felt unjustly. So to whom do we turn for guidance? And people feel that most politicians have been part of the being let down. Um, they feel that they've been disemboweled by their sages. And then we see that teachers and people who are involved in important aspects of our families' lives, professionals are being deprofessionalized, teachers demoralized, people in our health services um, are not valued as they should be. Experts are dismissed. Scientific rationality is described as false news by people like Mr. Trump. And we have to rediscover the creative ability that we have to reshape our world. We need better one planet thinking. And we have to think to really about bringing back a deeper sense of the purpose of living. What are we here for? Why are we here and what's it all about? And the unhappiness in so many lives ought to tell us that success alone is not enough. We only have to look at the high levels of loneliness of mental illness, of abuse of drugs and alcohol, of suicide uh, amongst our young and particularly young men, um, uh, at the neglect and abuse of children in our society, our failure towards the elderly. Material success has brought us to a strange spir spiritual and moral bankruptcy in many parts of our, of our country. And the more society has succeeded, the more its heart has failed. So we need a new social consciousness, and the poor and the hungry and the young generally need to be the focus of our economic and social responsibility. And I think that just as Eleanor Roosevelt called for the claiming of, a global, of global values in 1948, we should now be doing the same thing, having a recall about the fact that there is a crisis and what are the values that bind us. Find them again and make them crucial to the way in which we start moving forward, one with the other. We need to restore the preeminence of character over show and wisdom over cleverness. We need to be more a people of the world. And we need to see that outcomes are better when we work together in solidarity. And that tolerance and mutual respect are fundamental to peaceful coexistence. And that democracy and law are fundamental to it all. And I say that because I do believe that law is part, it's, it's, the, it's the twin pillar with democracy of what sustains societies that are decent and civilized. Law, but law which is suffused with human rights. That sometimes means that you have to sacrifice a level of sovereignty for a higher purpose. And it was interesting because um, we, we went back and looked at the beginnings of the European Convention of Human Rights, which were being sort of trounced and, 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 and dismissed by sections of our tabloid media particularly. And of course, what, what, what people hadn't remembered was that the European Convention of Human Rights wasn't drafted by bleeding heart liberals. It was drafted by a conservative attorney general at the behest of Churchill after the Second World War in 1950, um, who wanted this convention to be created and wanted us to have this thing that bound us across Europe. Um, and so the law wasn't drafted by uh, um, Europeans. It was drafted by British conservative lawyers. Um, and we recognised then that the higher goal of peace and justice meant creating overarching structures and institutions based on values that we shared and that it would involve creating a court over there um, but at w in which we would have judges, which we do, um, informing and developing that law as it has been developed over the past years. And one of the things that I have recognised now as I sit in the House of Lords and I chair uh, the European Union Justice Committee, we've been hearing evidence about what kind of law there is across Europe that in any way um, we should be mindful of losing if we, um, if we uh, depart from it and into the future as we leave Europe. And one of the things that we, we've recognised is that in many respects, um, enforcement procedures have come by a mutuality so that you can go on holiday in the roof of your uh, hotel 
shell fall in and suffer damage and you can go to a British court and get compensation ordered and it will be made effective in the court in Spain or in Portugal um, within, uh, within short order, having been decided here because we have that mutuality of recognition and we have enforcement procedures which make it possible. The same with a car accident. The same if you marry somebody from other parts of Europe and they renege on, after a divorce on paying maintenance for children. You can get an order in the courts here and it will be enforced in Italy next week. You're not being allowed to see your, your husband, not being allowed to see your children and you want access to them. You can get an order in the courts here and it will be enforced in Germany next week. Those things matter in the lives of ordinary people. You trade, and the, the thing you buy online is not up to standard. And many of these things were developed with the input of British lawyers, making sure that you could get an order and get the thing, uh, your money back, and the, the uh, uh, standards have not been met. And so they are difficult challenges. We're facing great challenges, but we have to recognise that in those, our responsibilities are to recognise that there has to be give and take, that there has to be collaboration, that there has to be better ways of working together, which sometimes mean stepping back as well as stepping forward. Automation is going to mean that more and more jobs in our world are going to disappear. And we have to be ready for that because of the effect it will have on the lives of our children and our grandchildren. But the jobs, of course, that will not disappear are the jobs which require our humanity, the jobs that require caring, the job of teaching. Some of it can be done online, but not all of it. The real work of teaching, teaching our children to speak and to gather language, teaching our children all the things that are necessary for life, involve engagement one to the other. The things that improve people's life in the world of health involves direct contact. Getting it online is not going to do it. The need that we have for care of our elderly is going to involve human capacity. The jobs of nurturing, of real teaching, of caring for each other, as well as the jobs of invention and creativity, they're not going to be done by machines. And yet the carers in our society are some of the least well paid and the most undervalued. And we're going to be forced to recalibrate the things in our society to which we should be attaching value. But I have faith that we can transform our society, but only if we're ready for change. Only if we're ready to have a rethink. Maya Angelou uh, wrote a beautiful poem on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. It was called A Brave and Startling Truth. And she advised us in it that the truly great wonder of our world is our own humanity and a recognition of our common humanity. When we come to it, we, this people on this wayward floating body, created on this earth of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely, without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible, we are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when and only when we come to it. And we have to come to it. And we have to meet the challenge and we have to be the best that we can be. Thank you. Kennedy will take a few questions if anyone has any. She'll look after you all. There's a lady with a hand up. Everybody all right? Oh, this one. Uh, you, you described uh, our current situation as being one of uh, virtual moral uh, crisis. And the last time we had that was uh, after the Second World War. So I'm just wondering what do you, which could you imagine the circumstances would be that might uh, bring us around to reconsidering the neoliberal values um, and the uh, haste to balance budgets? I, 
I think that we're being misled in being told that um, having debt, having national debt, is a, a, a serious uh, crisis for us. Um, we had a great deal of debt after the Second World War. The United States has a huge amount of debt. In fact, uh, China o- owns a large part of that debt. Um, and uh, and we, we should look about at the business of debt and, and, and what it really means. Um, and I, I think that when you're um, trying to deal with um, the failure that led to the, the 2008 um, economic crisis, you have to recognise that in some ways one of the best ways of getting out of it is to spend in order to actually uh, uh, create the kind of revi- revive, revival of your economy. One of the things that um, is, is we're also being misled by is that we're told all the time that in fact there's no real unemployment in Britain now. We've got the lowest unemployment across Europe. But one of the difficulties about that is that they're not real jobs. If you go up to uh, Newcastle, if you go up to the north of England and to many of the cities, the things that um, people, women of my age will say to you is, working class women will say to you is, I look at my sons and I look at my daughters and, uh, and they're not, they can't afford uh, to have a family. You know, I wonder at my son being able to ever uh, be able to be uh, a father like his father. I just, I, I fear for his future. I fear that he's never going to be, what, what happens when you can't afford to pay into pensions, when you're working on the gig economy, um, when you need to have several jobs in order to make uh, life come together at all, where you can't afford the rents that are being expected of you. I mean, currently in London, our young ca- have, are having problems even surviving. People who are creatives, and we're here talking about the business of, of those in our society who are creative and who are so vital to, to our sustenance as well as to um, our, uh, our lives. Liveliness as a na- as, as a nation is that um, they can't afford to live and survive um, in some of our cities, and so um, the future is, is not looking great. I mean, if you can talk about em- employment, but is it is it the kind of employment that uh, that really is in any way gives people a sense of the, of self and dignity that they can live a life? And I'm afraid that people feel that it isn't, and uh, and we haven't looked after. Um, whole sections of our society and we haven't been building homes that they can live in with some decency I mean I was brought up in a council home in Glasgow um, I remember we waited for 16 years um, on the on the housing list and uh, and having a home a proper home and not living in a tenement made such a difference to my family's sense of, of, of there being a life and uh, I, I just feel that we fail so many people. So when you ask me about you know, what's going to take us to the point, I think that we have to prioritise the business of proper employment, real jobs. I think we have to think about the ways in which we have not uh, um, uh, done well by whole communities where we should be thinking about uh, regenerating um, uh, those communities. And I think that, uh, um, that we should all recognise that there has been terrible neglect. And we got caught up in this business that there was plenty of money around um, during the 80s and 90s and and somehow turbo capitalism let rip. Um, I I think that we have to uh, have a rethink. And I think that um, just trying to make it soft around the edges as, as we did in our new labour years didn't, didn't work either. So the, the challenges are, are, are great, um, but I think that they're not above us. Our ingenuity is also great um, and we can make better societies. Um, I, feel, I feel that leaving Europe is a, is a great um, uh, step backwards. Um, I don't believe that um, being part of the WTO and getting all these trading deals with other parts of the world is going to come on on song in the way that people imagine. And I think that uh, that is going to have a huge cost for people and going to make even more people um, have hard and difficult lives. So um, I'm worried for the future, but I, but, I, but I don't give up my optimism because it's people who can pull things back. It's people who can, uh, um, you know, call for a different, a different way. Um, and whether we have the leadership for that, I'm not sure. But um, I, I do believe that uh, we can make our voices heard, that we want something better. And then you have to live out um, the things you believe in in your own daily round and um, try and make that difference. For me, it was education that changed my life. 
And it's why I have this little foundation and when I do things, I try to get money to put into it and I try to raise money for it to make opportunities available, second chances often for people who got it wrong first time round, girls who got pregnant, young men who entered trouble or whatever. And asylum seekers, people who come and make, try to make a new life um, and, and to give them opportunities where education will, will equip them for something better. Um, but we have to me mean it when we say it will be something better. This, yes, this lady here at the end of the row had a hand up, didn't you? I thought the lady on the steps had her hand up a minute ago. Oh, I yes. Can, but I, I just take the opportunity to thank you. What um, a school like this really needs is an aspirational opening address. And you have certainly given us that, particularly at a time when I think we all struggle on a daily basis with our despair and disappointment with the democracy that has brought our attitude to Europe and the president. Mm. as there is in America. So I'm just taking the opportunity to thank you. Ah, oh, well, that, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Barons Kennedy, have you any advice for those communities whose compassion is being strained to breaking point? For example, around Italian ports, where more and more migrants are being landed with, uh, with the help of smugglers and international rescue boats. Thank you. I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't know how Italy... I mean, given, given that Italy's got its own economic problems, Greece has, uh, you know, has had the most incredible uh, uh, time of austerity and, and difficulties, and now having to deal with this on top of it all. And so, um, of course, you know, we can, we can understand any kind of fatigue in terms of feeling generosity of spirit. Um, but that's why there, had, there, there is a responsibility, for example, to share around the business of Syrian refugees, because some of those people are Syrian refugees. But others, of course, are people who are fleeing in Africa from uh, the effects of poverty and climate change. And so I get very dispirited when people say, why should we be giving aid um, to other parts of the world? Aid to other parts of the world while helping the lives of other people in other parts of the world is also self-serving. It also helps us because it has the benefit of making sure that you know, people don't leave their own nations usually willingly. They want to stay with their own folk more or less but what they, what they do is they leave usually out of desperation. And many of those people fleeing from sub-Saharan Africa, those particularly young men, are given the family's money and the family say, you know, go, go, go north, young man. You know, make a break for it. Have a life as we would with any of our sons if we were living in immiseration too. And so the, you have to look at, first of all, what are we doing in helping the developing world really develop? Um, this, and helping their markets and so on. And the second thing that we have to ask ourselves is, are we doing enough about climate change? Because for a lot of those people are moving because of the, it's, that part of Africa is becoming, it's becoming desert. And then you get conflict over water and you get conflicts happening which people flee from. So um, many of them are fleeing from their own misery as people have done through the, since the beginning of time. America is made up of people who fled from famine and from impoverishment and uh, from conflict. And so moving of people is what happens. And, uh, and uh, there are fewer places in the world where, the, where there is space to accommodate people. So the way that we have to, as a, as a world, deal with that is to try to find ways of developing and helping those parts of the world sustain themselves. And, uh, and so to listen to Priti Patel talking about um, reducing the amount of money um, and being dismissive of what uh, is being done in the, in the developing world, um, she's actually had to learn by going there and seeing it that it actually is to our, to our benefit. But we also have to reckon with climate change. And it's why that the business of denying it and calling it fake news and denying the science of it is absolutely crazy. As waters rise, people are losing their livelihoods on the ocean's edges, they move further inland as, as the centre of Africa and other continents, part of Syria in fact, many of the people who moved to cities and then in turn were involved in the rioting against Assad were, were fleeing from bits where they couldn't make a livelihood anymore because of, of climate change affecting them. So 
we've got to reckon with the fact that climate change is going to have huge consequences and we're going to have to worry about how we deal with it. And I recently sat on a, a, an International Bar Association commission to look at, I cha- co-chaired it with an environmental uh, judge, to look at the effects of climate change and the effects on, on the human rights of people because people are going to have to move lock, stock and barrel um, if we don't uh, do serious things about climate change. And that does involve having to think again about our lifestyles, the way in which we live and whether we shouldn't be living differently and whether that will be about having to look at the things that we've got used to um, and and, and changing some of our own ways of living. And, And it's hard to expect that of people because people don't want to step back when they've enjoyed, you know, uh, air conditioning and high levels of central heating and the use of vehicles and so on. They don't want to do that. And then people, of course, around poorer parts of the world look at us on television and see the way that we live and think, I want some of that too. So it's a very hard thing uh, to confront, but we're going to have to confront it if we aren't going to be uh, seeing many more of those boats um, and people moving um, across the world and and it will be the richer nations that will be presented with it and we will end up with serious war and conflict if we don't address the central problem about why that's happening. So I, yes, I feel that compassion gets, uh, gets uh, shrunk in the face of that um, and I don't think we should be asking people to just carry on being generous and generous and generous. Um, we have to share and share and share the responsibility um, for what is taking place. Um, but I, I also think that, you know, the business of saying, do you rescue people from the sea um, when they're out there drowning? I think that the first call on us as human beings is to rescue. But we have to then be thinking about what do you do then and what do we do before the need for people to rescue. And I certainly think that when it comes to trafficking, you have to, the only way that we can deal with this is by cross-border cooperation. And that involves law, and that involves courts, and that involves prosecuting people. And we do incredible work. I've done a whole set of cases involving trafficking, usually of women and children. And the only way that we can get people is by having the cooperation of, um, of police forces, law enforcement, and other parts of Eurojust, the Euro Warrant. Across Europe, we've been very effective in getting some of the people who run uh, trafficking gangs. Um, and it's only by that kind of working together. And people come now in front of our committee in the House of Lords and they say to us, you know, on the one hand, you want all those things to keep, keep operating, but it can't because if sometimes there will be people who challenge the use of a warrant and there has to be a court to which you go and they're not going to want it just to be your court why can't they want it to be a court that involves judges from other parts of Europe too, so that it's a collaborative thing. And so all I'm saying to you is we have to reckon with the fact that these things involve working together. And working together means that you have to see bigger entities existing to make it possible. And I think that we're entrenching and retreating from some of the things that resolve or have at least a possibility of resolving some of the world's problems. You rightly started with Eleanor Roosevelt, and I suppose what I want to say is, um, what do we do where she left off? And I think you've now touched on it. How do we move from national boundaries to international rights? Now, we've been able to do it to some extent in the International Criminal Court, Mm -hmm. but we are a long way short in relation to civil, political, and human rights, which are enforceable internationally. Of course, we have got the European Convention, but they are broadly confined within a better part of the developed world. Mm-hmm. And we've got to move on this, and I think there are big problems in doing that, not least in how we approach the United Nations. I don't know if you agree about it. Well, well I, mean, I, I do agree, but let, let, let's, start, let's start with one thing. Around the world, we sometimes don't realise this because when we off go travelling, it's not the sort of thing that we sit around in cafes or in uh, talking about to the, to the locals. But actually, um, the, the European Court of Human Rights 
is admired throughout the world as being you know, a beacon that people want to, to have a similar thing. A, a collaboration of countries in a region and for there to be something overarching because so many of these problems cross borders. And so, for example, Africa is now in the, in the process of creating an African Court of Human Rights. And so there, 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 is a, a sort of, there are steps being taken for the development of that in order to copy the European Court of Human Rights. The idea being that sometimes it's better that you have people from elsewhere so you can you know, bring your case to a body that um, will say, are we living up to the template? It's that thing of having a, a sort of set of standards down the side and it's a tick box. And, you know, we, and I use it when I'm talking to people who are in, in Islamic countries. When I go to speak to conferences of women, as I do in Abu Dhabi and the University for Women there, and I talk about human rights being something that, you know, they may want to say, how, how does Sharia law measure up to some of these things? And, and that was its purpose, was to look and see, are, are the values in, in these collective human rights seen as valuing things across, across humanity? Are we living up to them in the legal systems that have been created? I would argue that, of course, most legal systems were created by men, um, because that was the nature of things, um, that, that men were our, our, our sources of wisdom, men were the lawyers and the great judges. And therefore, it's not surprising that law came from the perspective of men as judges um, and as lawmakers. And so they're having to be challenged as we, as women, have taken our place in the world and said, hold on, is this law delivering for us? And so when I speak to women's groups, in other parts of the world, I say, look and see, does it work for us? Does it deal with the reality of women's lives? The idea that women, that you need two women as, as testimony, um, rather than you know, to be even to the testimony of a man and so on, how can that possibly be, be right? And, and so you, and you start looking at it and you find that it's actually not you know, religiously based at all. It's been, it's been man-made. And so um, all I'm saying is that uh, we look at the European Convention on Human Rights and you, lots of, you know, you'll get the, the Daily Mail will go into high dudgeon over certain decisions. No court ever gets everything right anywhere. Um, but by and large, we've been travelling on a, on, a, on, a, on a road that has been a, a good road in getting the rights and protections developed for, for across the board for victims of crime. I mean, you know, the protection for victims has come out of the of the human rights protections. Um, the, the calls for inquests, whether it be for soldiers or for whoever, you know, often people are able to use human rights uh, 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 conventions. Um, many of the things for disabled rights, for the rights of, 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 of gays, for the rights of many different peoples in our society who, 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 who suffer um, uh, uh, abuses, of being able to, to be, uh, uh, have empowerment through human rights legislation. And so other parts of the world are looking to it. And I just think that for us to be pulling out of that, not especially when actually, and I say this, and I've, I've got lawyer friends in the audience, British lawyers are, are rather good at law. We're good at law. And actually, we've been hugely influential in the development of European law. It's not all come at us as a big wash from over there. We've actually been doing that in the opposite direction. And so, what, and it's affecting the world. And one of the things that you need in all of our relations is law in order to provide you with a sort of safety net when things go wrong. And, um, and so law is one of the fundamentals in any safe and peaceful world. So when you say, what do we do about those other places in the world where the, the human rights abuses are even more egregious and terrible? And the answer is, you keep you know, helping develop institutions that can provide protection. You keep raising those standards and working around those issues. And, um, and you, you, but you have to listen to what people are saying. I was sent out recently um, by the... Euro, uh, the, uh, the in fact, for the State Department of the United States to Iraq, because when the Americans pulled out of Iraq, they set up a number of uh, human rights programs um, around prisons, rights in prisons. And the other thing they did was on, on women's rights. And, uh, and so the, every, after five years, they needed an independent assessment of are those things working? Is the American tax dollar being well spent? And so they, uh, you don't use, you know, you use somebody from somewhere else. And so uh, they went to the foreign office, and I in turn, then I end up being the person who goes out to uh, to Iraq. And um, 
I flew twice. I went to Baghdad and then I went down to Basra and I went to prisons and I met with women's organizations and I met with different people. And one of the things that was very clear to me was, well, for, first of all, the, the business on, in prisons was about there being UN standards, United Nations standards in prisons, that people should have an exercise yard, that people shouldn't be just the, the key thrown away, that there should be a complaint system, an ombudsman, that there should be um, opportunities to write to your family um, and, uh, and, and have connection with people in the outside world world, that sort of basic thing that we think should in any civilised world exist, but, but doesn't. And so it was to get those standards up. And, um, and then on the women's front was, that, that was to maintain women's rights. Let me tell you, I would speak to, to the women's organisations and they would say to me, you know, Saddam was terrible, but... I got to university under Saddam. There was a, it was a secular society, secular being that you know it was it was you know it was run along lines that were trying to emulate parts of the West. And and the, the women got to university. They've now got a Sharia law system where girls are being pulled out of school as soon as they reach puberty. And and so these women, educated women who were running organ, women's organisations, were saying we're having to struggle with families doing this and taking the girls out and having child marriage, people wanting child marriage reintroduced. And when we go to the courts, the problem is that you end up having Sharia courts with people who, whose, whose world view does not accommodate human rights. And so, um, you know, you really, we really are having to think about what was done there in terms of the fabric of society and so you know uh, um, not it didn't work too well for women let me tell you what, what um, our invasion of Iraq so um, uh, it was interesting I went into a prison um, where there was a, a whole section um, where there were women and it was only by accident that I you know I, we were talking about the numbers of people in the prison and um, the prison governor was feeling quite p- proud of what he was achieving in co- in, in conforming to the uh, UN uh, standards, which are called the Mandela standards now, because of Mandela's imprisonment, and uh, and and he mentioned that there were women. I said, "Oh, there you've got women in this prison," and I said, uh, uh, "Can I can I visit the women's bit?" And they were kind of a bit reluctant. And then I go to the women's bit. Of course, there's no exercise yard for the women. Women don't exercise, and so there was no place. And the the bit of ground outside of the women's dorm place, prison cell, which was like a kind of horrible dormitory with three levels of bunks. Um, was was it was the, was the washing line, and the women were the laundresses for the whole of the prison, and worse, worse than that, when I went in, there was a child running around, and the child, it turned out, was the product of um, one of the young women who was imprisoned there um, um, had had a baby by um, an American GI, and uh, so she'd ended up in this prison, which had a was one of the few places that had a women's section. And the, the baby was in there with her, with toddler, uh, well, four, four, four and a half the child was, and um, running around, but the only child. And of course, you know, in a place where there were no other children to play with, the other women were all loving and, you know, there were 30 mothers to this child. Um, and uh, and they, when I asked about it, all those women were in there for morality offences. And morality offences were about... Um, being seen talking to, to men or being seen having a, having a boyfriend when you weren't allowed to have and being jailed for that. And the reason this child was in prison with her mother was because the girl had, the mother had been rejected by her family because of this and the child was rejected. And when I said, spoke about it, they said, listen, if you make complaint about the child being in here, this child will be sent out. There's no tradition of adoption or anything like that. The family will not want the child and that child will end up being trafficked. And so, you know, the, the, the problems of, about trying to create standards in places are not straightforward. Um, but uh, um, the only way you can do it is by working collaboratively and, uh, and seeking to raise standards. And it's slow and it's arduous, but it's about dreaming for a better world. And you can only do that with others. And you can only do it across borders, and you can only do it by creating institutions across borders, and you can only do it by uh, that um, recognition that in the end you have to have supranational courts.